This is wisdom from great masters, each one writing about the same thing from their own perspectives. This is Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, and Lao Tzu, parallel sayings. And I wonder if you could tell who says what. In order to know everything, you must first know yourself. If you do not know yourself, then you know nothing. Those who know themselves also know the all. Next teacher. If you would become perfect, discover the self within. Seek this awareness and not intelligence. The next teacher. In the realms of suchness, there is neither self nor other. The only way to see what is real is to consider all things as being not two. T-W-O. The next teacher. Wisdom comes from knowing oneself. He who knows himself is enlightened. Which one was Buddha? The last one. Wrong. <laughs> Lao Tzu. Krishna said, if you would be perfect, discover the self from within. Seek this awareness and not intelligence, meaning reason. Seek the self within. This is where we're going today. I didn't choose this because I was like, what should I do? This is where we're going. Buddha said, in the realms of suchness, meaning illusion, there is neither the self nor the other. It's not about you or me. It's not about the ego or reason or which part of me. Think of how many parts of you you play with in the world behind your eye. The only way to see what's real is to consider all things as being neither this or that. It's seeing all things as not having more authority than nothing. That is a mystical truth, not a rational one. What is the difference between a mystical truth and a rational truth? Your mind can't get that, but your soul can. And that's where I'm going to push you into the soul if it's the last thing I do. <laughs> Get in there! <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Just picture yourself in front of this little keyhole and me going, Get in there! <laughs> I will do it if it's the last thing I do, so help me, God. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I love the world of mysticism. I love, I love being a mystic. I've never loved anything until I got the crap beat out of me and woke up. I never lived. It's like Rumi said, you, heaven crushes you like a grape, and then you become fine wine. And then... Okay. I thought, Robert, I thought, what happened to my mess? <laughs> okay. I'll tell you the truth, and I mean truth. This is the difference between what's true and truth. It's true that we're in Sedona, but there's no truth to that. Because it won't, tomorrow that won't be true. So true is something that you carry temporarily. Truth sustains you forever. That's the difference between what Teresa called the well you dig and the well that's given. Truth will always be there. It will always be truth. It can't deviate, gravity is truth. You're always going to fall. Truth is, it will always, always, always be there. 
I'm going to take a pause. Stacy, at break time, please, please, please talk to me so I can introduce you about tonight. Thank you. Um, the, I need to focus us, because it's so important that I get through five years of wisdom in the next few hours we have before we part tomorrow. What is so important is the jewel, are the jewels that you understand how powerful every choice you make in your life is. How every choice you make sets into motion consequences that your body feels in every cell tissue, that your life feels in every, and not just feels, that changes the direction in your life in every single possible way. That everybody in your life senses on the airwaves in your life. That even though you may not see the consequences, you've set them in motion and that <clears throat> what it, it, what's so critical for you to become is someone whose sense of self no longer demands to see immediate consequences. That you mature yourself. That you mature yourself into someone who is not operating on the lesser world that says, I have to see the consequences of everything I do right now. They have to be practical, they have to be pay off. And, 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 <clears throat> and it has to have the kind of power. So I see that power play off on your face. So I see the power have a consequence in my bank account. So I see the power somehow play off in this physical world or I do not see the measure of my power. Do you understand what I'm saying? In this world, in the lesser world, in the physical world, you define power by what you have, by who you can control, by who you can control, by what words you can use to bend someone or break someone. Make someone yield. Make this world dance around you. This is, that kind of power costs you your energy. And as a medical to intuitive, I, I will tell you, wait a minute, I need a, another piece of paper here. If you used all these, Robert, start running now. <laughs> okay. Um, you need to keep this in mind. When I first started to do this brilliant sketch of mine, <laughs> this brilliant sketch of mine, I did it on the macro with you, meaning I would chart years and years ago how you lost power based on huge things. Like, I was traumatized as a child. I was beaten, I was raped, I was this, I was that. I'm divorced, I can't get over that, I can't get over this. Big, huge things that you could identify that were obvious. I had an accident, I was yeah, lost, someone did this, someone did that. And always from your victim archetype. Always from your victim. Now someone asked about what's an archetype. Do you get what an archetype is now? Is anybody floating in space, so I have to talk what an archetype is. When I say archetype, are you with me or are you not? Yes. What? I'm still not very clear. What do you think it is? It's a pattern of power, something in your nature. If I said, that person is a good mother, what does that mean to you? Do I have to say anything else? What do you associate with good mother? But that's very obvious. I didn't, doesn't matter, what do you associate with that? And what else? Yes. <laughs> Hello. 
What else do you associate with that? Giving, nurturing, unconditional love. Everybody else would associate that too. Because that goes with the pattern. And if I said that person is a devouring mother, describe it. Selfless. Devouring. <laughs> Needy. Okay. What does it mean to devour something? I devoured my dinner. That doesn't mean I'm needy for dinner. What does devour mean? To eat, to eat with mindfulness, to consume, to devour. I was so hungry. A devouring mother. It means I consume my children. I eat them alive. They don't have a life of their own. I've devoured them. <clears throat> That's a devouring mother. Mother Russia, as a nation when she was, is a devouring mother. That's how she formed the Soviet Union. They call her Mother Russia. She was the devouring mother. She wants to be that again, and that's what made Putin rise. He rose on that archetype, the czar on devouring Russia. Archetype. It's a pattern of power in you. Do you get that? Yeah. What's your natural power? What is, what's your nature? What's in your nature that's just like you? You got three seconds and I'm going back to my class. Giving. No, 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 no. What is typical of you? That you say you're giving, and what else? Do you rescue people? Yeah. That's the rescuer. That's the rescuer. You have the rescuer pattern. Can you help yourself from rescuing? Do you just do it automatically? Yeah. That's the pattern. It kicks in. Do you ever say to yourself, I've got to stop doing this? Now I do. Do, do you think you'll be able to? Yes. Okay. I, I have, I, I'm learning to see if it's a manipulative act on the other person or is a real need. Right. So this is what you're doing. Rescuers are like lifeguards at a pool. And they all start out as pushing people in so they could rescue them. They all do it. They all do it because that's how it all, because that's the pattern. And then they jump in the pool and they rescue the person and they take the person and they want to be taken home and rewarded. Then I'm not that person. And then they all want to do that. They all want praise for rescuing. And everybody's wondering what the hell is this lifeguard doing in my home? And they eventually kick the lifeguard out and the lifeguard stands there feeling so rejected. And if the lifeguard wakes up, he'll notice there's no pool here. That's right. <laughs> That's right, lifeguard. Because you are so screwing this up. So then the lifeguard goes and feels so rejected. Until the lifeguard learns. I jump in the pool when needed. I pull the person out. And then I go back to my platform. And I sit there until I'm needed. Rescuing is not about love. It's about a skill to rescue someone who's drowning. Done. Love is something else entirely. Get your needs off the platform. Are you with me? You will always have the rescuer pattern. Pattern is a pattern of power. This is why you have to know yourself. You have to know your patterns. So you're going to have to begin from, ask your friends what your patterns are. Believe me, they know. <laughs> Trust me when I tell you you have a child. Trust me when I tell you. You have a child archetype. 
you have a saboteur. And one pattern in your saboteur is the decision not to see yourself. I don't know. I don't know if I do. I don't know. That's part of not wanting to, the journey in the self with a small candle. Do you see what I'm saying? It's all right, we'll get you in there. <laughs> I'm relentless now. I always win. Um, <laughs> in the classroom, this, uh, this is you. This is you. Whenever you make decisions that are based on a, your compass of power is in the lower level and your perception is that power is outside of you and that things and stuff have power, every decision you make is going to cost you power. Every single one, every single one, every single one. Because your calculations will all be based on fear. Everyone will be based on fear, manipulation, inadequacy, and low self-esteem. Fear, manipulation, inadequacy, and low self-esteem. That's all you got going for you. You will buy things because you think, this will make me look better. You'll do things, you'll go places. You won't go to Southern Ohio for a vacation, you'll go to some place everyone recognizes. And then you write those cards at Christmas, see where we were? <laughs> Who the hell cares where you were? But, okay. You, need attention. It doesn't occur to you. This is you need your life physically validated. See, I'm here, I'm here, because you are so in that physicalness. It's all about that. Now, it still could be about that, but it depends on where your compass is. Power on the outside. And these choices, for whatever, the choices that you make inevitably cost you because of power calculations. Now let me explain this. How many of you are in control issues presently? Hands up. Okay, how many of you have unfinished business? Things that you just, it's not settled. How do you want it settled? In your favor. Always in your favor. It never will be. Do we know that? Okay, what are you gonna do about that? Now, how come it's so difficult to let that go? Huh? Because you made it personal. Because what is it you're actually looking for? Right, to be right, and validation. You want to win. You want your wound validated. So it's really about a wound. It's really about your sense, my injustice is worse than yours. And that's all there's to it, and I will hang on to this. It's the victim. So it's this sense of, you took my power. And one way or another, I want my power back. So it's a power calculation. Can we see that? And all the time that you're holding on to it, here's you in present time. Every day you get up, so imagine you have $100. Every day you get up, you are financing this. And it goes like this. All the things you're hanging on to, all the power struggles, all the things Buddha would call illusions, all the things Jesus would, would say, would call the dead. This is what he referred to as the dead. Things that, you, that are not here anymore. You get up and you say, how much of my present life energy do I have to give 
to keep the dead alive on, on energetic respirators. All your control issues, all, all of this. So you say, this cost me $5, this cost me 50 cents, this cost me this. And how do you know that you're financing something? Do you want my pen? Does anybody want my pen? No, no you want my pen? <laughs> All right, now, no, no, I'm very, very serious. I want you to center yourself. I really want you to center yourself. And, and sense if any part of your biology, any part of your biology, your stomach, your mind, your, your hand, is actually leaving your body and craving my pen. Sitting there thinking, I have to figure out a way to get her pen. I have to figure out a way to figure out a way to get that pen. Now I'm serious about this. Yes or no? You're not serious. You're not. No, I'm, but I am serious. All right, but I am serious. I need you to imprint what it feels like to not crave something. To not crave something. So that you actually have an imprint in you of what it feels like to have your body totally not engage. So that you think black pen. So that you can stand in front of something, what if, whether it's a cookie or a diamond or someone looking at you and saying, you jackass, and think black pen. You think I'm kidding? I am not. I am not. That you instantly go into that and your, your soul stays completely, completely at your command so that you can say do not engage this spectacle I am not losing my power to this no way in hell am I letting my spirit attach to those words to those words this person said to me those are those, that's a sound current and in one second, the sound will be over. And if you came to me and said, I'm so upset, that person said, I would say to you, bring me the sound in a box. Bring me the words and the sound in a box, and we'll, we'll talk about it. There's nothing you could put in that box. That's what Buddha said. It's nothingness. But you are now attached to this nothingness. And it's costing you. And now I'm going to tell you how much it costs you. This is psychic weight w-e-i-g-h-t and that equals physical weight there's a calculation here the more psychic weight you have the more physical time and weight you create in your life this is your this is the formula for how you create your relationship to time and space the more attachments you have, the longer you have to wait for everything. Healing, synchronicity, absolute, the, you, you age faster. This is how you load up cell memory. This is how you densify. When somebody has, <clears throat> when someone has a quick hit inspiration, if, I, if you said to me, Carolyn, I, I need to do some blah, 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 and I said, I have a great idea. I have an inspiration for you. Why don't you do this? If you have all these anchors, this is what you'll do. The inspiration will come in, and you'll think, huh. And then you will... I'll give you the inspiration. It'll come in and you'll language it in your own vocabulary. And then you will run it through your anchors. And as you run it through your anchors, you'll think, well, if I do this, it will, 
how will I finance this part of my life? It'll change this person. Well, I don't know, I can't change this. I'll have to change this. I'll have to change this. I'm attached to this support group. I don't know, I'm not, I might have to actually heal this part of myself. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Well, maybe I'll do that and then this will come out of your mouth. The time's not right. You'll give me a time answer. The time is not right. Why is the time not right? It's a perfect idea for you. Because you have too many anchors. And you do not want to change the lower floors of your life for a higher floor inspiration. You're not ready to move out the sludge. You're still ready to suffer. You're still in your quagmire. And let me tell you something. By getting rid of your anchors, if you'll ever notice, I always, I, I always make suggestions when someone says, well, just tell me how. If I really told you how at full throttle, you'd fly across the room and go, no. So I always give people baby throttles. baby throttlets, and I always tell you, I want you to clean out your closet. I want you to clean out your files. I want you to walk around the block once a day, and then I want you to add one block every two days. I want you to start out small because you are so afraid of change. I want you to start because the object is just to get you to commit to doing something different and new and good for you once a day. The object, the operative word is devotion. To start an actual devotion that will strengthen your soul. Where you have to do, I'm sending you into battle with your soul. And I'm sending you in with a butter knife and not Excalibur. And not Excalibur. Because you have no muscles yet. You have nothing. You're not ready to take on the whole of your gravity field. From a mystical point of view, the laws of mysticism. You've engaged a battle. You've engaged contact now with your soul. You've engaged contact. You've said, okay, take me on. And if you really got it, it's like you turning around. Instead of looking through your eyes, you've turned around and you've looked inside of yourself and you're bowing to your strength and said, begin, take me on. You're looking at your own sacred nature, your own holy nature, and you're saying, begin, begin my training with the, with the holiest part of you. Begin my training. Just like you have to do that with your, you go to school to train your brain kindergarten through university. You go to school to train your brain. We don't let the brain run around like a feral animal. It must be disciplined and trained. The same thing is true with your soul. It must be, you must, it must be disciplined because it, it, it holds so, it holds the knowledge of the universe when it starts to speak to you. So, The great spiritual teachers came down here because though life is very brief, life is but a blink of an eye, as they've all said, was human life meant to be so painful, really? Was it meant to be so, 
you know, overwhelming. How much of what we experience is really self-inflicted because we don't know the rules. Or to say it differently, because we don't understand how to actually use the power we wield. Because we actually don't realize the power that's held in the words we use. We don't know the consequences of what we're doing. We don't actually get that. Everything we do really is observed. That everything we do and say actually matters. It actually does matter. We don't really honor, believe that what is in one is actually in the whole. That if I hurt you, I really am hurting myself. That we simply don't care about these things that we really do participate in the act of co-creation. We really are part of this ecology, not by observers, but by participants. Now, the difference between how we are in the lower world and how you become in the mystical upper world, when you enter your mystical consciousness training, is that when you're down here, you live as an observer. You go into nature to observe it, to dominate it, to control it. People in this world say, I think I need a weekend in nature because I'm not of nature. I am an observer of nature. I live in the city. I don't live in nature. Are you standing on the planet, idiot? What do you think that is? Do you think somehow or other the city is not on the nature ecological planet? That it's still not pulsating ley lines and the life system? Oxygen doesn't flow in the city? Ley lines don't go through the city. Is this not nature, excuse me? Because you can't see a tree. You've declared nature doesn't exist here. That is a classic tree hugger line. God. All right. Yeah. Pardon me while I compose myself. All right. It's like, yeah, mm. stop it, Carol. All right, this, this classic from people who live on the outside of life. They have not made contact with the soul of anything, including themselves. Everything is based on what they see and where they go, but not on the inside. Their soul can't feel the life force of anything. They have to see it to be there. They can't sense it. The mystical, in this world, the mystical laws and the laws of science are the exact same laws. Exact same laws. The laws of science are the mystical laws in physical form. The laws of gravity, cause and effect, action and reaction, all the laws of science are the mystical laws in physical form. The difference is, and it's a gargantuan difference, it's a sacred dif difference, come up here. The mystical laws operate in your soul and they operate in the universe. The mystical laws are mal malleable. They operate in consciousness. They are the ones that are in the energy field and they flow with choice and they flow with energy. So once choice is made, they then enter into the flow of physical creation. So take the law of gravity. 
Gravity, the word, even the word gravity Latin is gravitas. To t do something grave. It means serious and it means to take to the grave. To take something from the world of energy and to bring it to matter. So this I want to zoom, imprint into your soul. Which means if you make a choice, it's the first mystical law right here in your first chakra, right here in your roots, the root of the tree of life that runs right in you in Judaism, right to the root, your tree of life, down to your roots. I want you to think, Every choice I make, including how am I going to see that person? How am I going to think? I get up in the morning, I look out the window. Do I choose to say, what a beautiful day? Or, oh no. Or, shall I be open today? Lord, what a gorgeous day you've given me. Or, oh no, I'm not happy. Who's going to make me happy? Are you going to be someone who thinks life should be a delivery system to you? which is classic of a first floor person. Who's delivering the goods to me? I'm not happy, pound, pound, pound. Or are you someone who stands up and looks and says, this vocabulary is so rotten, it is producing nothing. I gotta get this out of my head. And I've got to use a different vocabulary here. I'm gonna get up and say, what a day you've given me. This day of my life will never come again. How then shall I use this? Talk to me. And start your day like that. How then shall I use this day of grace? Day of grace. That's what I think I shall call this. A day of grace. I think I'll use those words. I like those words. The magnetics are so high. Now, I'm going to set those magnetics in motion. Day of grace. I think I have a day of grace here. Totally different than, oh no, everybody's disappointed me. Or, I don't have the energy. Yes, you do. Don't you dare tell yourself that. Don't you ever talk to yourself that way. Ever. Don't you curse yourself like that. You stand up and say, I have plenty of energy. I have so much energy, I can hardly stay in my body. I am blessed with energy. I am blessed with life. That's how you get up and that's your prayer. I am blessed with life. You're in your body, you're blessed with life. Do not talk to yourself like a corpse. Ever. Do you get up and you, you change those words. What are the mystical laws? They are these malleable power laws that as they incarnate, they solidify and think that what you say goes from grav, gravitas into solid form. And so you set your life in motion. So you set your life in motion here. I have blessed this day with grace, period. End of it. Do you think that's going to cost you energy, or will that be an investment in you? Which is it? Bingo. And that's all you know. I bless this day, and I'm on my way. Bless this day on my way. Bless this day on my way. And you don't think like a two-year-old. Am I getting rewarded for this? I'll put your head in the toilet for seven minutes if you think that way. This is not how you think. You think like, that's it. I am alive. This is my day. I'm out of here. I, and you don't think like, geez, I was born for something special. Who told you that crap? Who filled you with that? And don't tell your kids that. That is the most painful piece of useless propaganda. You may think your kids are something special, and I hope you do, but I don't think they are. And I got news for you, no one else does. They just haven't told you that. <laughs> and they don't want to hear it. You're the only ones who should think your kids are special. 
and lavish them with that love, but by God, do not tell them this world thinks that. Because there's no one out in this world who is lined up to give your kids a special life. And you render them spineless and backboneless by letting them go into this world with this attitude that they were that their life purpose, their life purpose is to be someone special. Since when is that a life purpose? And what does special mean? They think it means to be given things, to be lavished, to be rewarded because they were born. I know people, I meet them all the time in my workshops who are miserable, who are depressed because they haven't found their specialness. Because they haven't found theirs, because they think I should be recognized. For what? Tell me for what? Teresa of Avila would have said to her nuns, you get in that kitchen and you peel potatoes until you snap out of this. Until you snap out of this. What is this need to be recognized people have? Do anyone want to answer that for me? <laughs> okay. Huh? Yes, but what is the need? I get what part of you, but what is that craving? If someone says, okay, I recognize you, what does that satisfy? What does that mean? What part of you now feels like, whew, what is that? Survival. How does, no, stop answering me in a word. Give me a sentence. I speak to you in a sentence. It means you won't starve. That's the first intelligent answer I've ever gotten. No, 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 for that question, for that question. That is the first actual answer that makes sense to me. Yeah. So it's a survival, it's a survival thing. I'll survive because you've seen me. In the limbic system. In the limbic system, okay, I, okay, okay, yeah. No, no, if we don't get that microphone to you. Where's my microphone runner? There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Bless your soul, go. No, it's, it's, so it's a version of survival. This is yeah, another language. I love it. So it's kind of, to me, it kind of connects to that idea of limited resources. And if we think of infinity and that there is just pure eternal energy that we abundantly can get to, then would we want to be recognized, you know? That, that's just my sort of reflection on that. I really appreciate these answers. I cannot tell you how much. This really, really, really... Um, and are you aware of that? Like, I need to be recognized or I won't survive? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, because, you know what, that makes so much sense because where we're going is we're crossing a bridge now. Because this is your literal world. You see, your lower world is literal and you take everything literally there. And when I was dealing with why people don't heal, why, why can't you get out of this damn world? It's your literal world. So if someone says something, you take it literally. Like, you know, I, I, Debbie is one of the best dressed people that ever comes to my workshop. I always wondered if Debbie Gill's coming, she's always gonna look like spectacular. And, and, so if I said to her, oh boy, you look like an orange or whatever, if I, t <laughs> Debbie would, like I could tease her, but what if one day she took it literally? She knows that I just love her dearly, but if you took it literally. I'd say, what are you talking, Debbie? I've known you years here, I'm teasing you. But one day someone could take it literally. 
And you think, what are you talking about? I've always teased you. Da, 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 da. But it's literal. And I know now they're down here and there's nothing I can get. I can't get them out of it. I can't get them out of it. Okay? Once someone is down here. But your soul, and here we go into mysticism now. And when I started my workshop with you and I asked some of you, why are you here? All of your quests can only be dealt with up here. So now we cross over into a world, your ego is always looking for reasons, but your soul is always looking for meaning and purpose. Your soul always looks for rational order. Like I need to know this, this you have to explain this justice. Why did this happen? Why did this happen to me? Me, 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 me. The operative word down here is me. Why did it happen to me? <laughs> but up here, your soul strives to say, learn from this. Empower yourself. Find the purpose in this. Find the meaning in this. Search, go. And this cannot be found at the level on which the experience happened. We have to go up to the symbolic meaning, to the symbolism held in every single word. There isn't a word or an experience or an exchange or a conversation. A movement, a hand movement, a gesture. There's nothing, there's nothing that does not contain an archetypal thread. I saw an interview this morning and the, the uh, interviewer was speaking to, an inter to a uh, gentleman who claimed to have had a history of working as a intelligence operator in Russia and of course everything's about this memo, 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 memo. And he was speaking um, trying to say how this, he was speaking on behalf of the administration. And one of the things he did was when he got on, when he first started, he looked right into the camera and he winked. He winked, he went. And then he did his, and I saw that. Now I thought, that was a deliberate gesture. I don't know who he was signaling and I don't know who he was talking to. But a whole story was contained in that gesture. A whole story was contained in that. And I wonder if someone else caught it, I'm sure, because we are so heightened, we're catching everything. So, <clears throat> nothing, the, the world of, some, your life symbolically, your life archetypally, tells a very different story than your life literally. Your life symbolically, I cannot emphasize this enough, if I take your life apart symbolically, if we examine your life archetypally, it is a very different story that reveals a very different journey than the one you are living literally. It's a very different, just like when, if Robert read your chart, he would tell you a story of your life that's filled with planetary voices. The role that Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Uranus, Pla Pluto, Saturn, the Sun, all of these astrological configurations, how they speak to your life in a vocabulary that you, new words, new power, new forces, these are archetypes. Plut Plato was the first one to use the word archetype. He said the gods are archetypes, the planets are archetypes. These are power zones that have a particular type of power. 
<clears throat> maybe this will help you. Do you know what an addict is? Does everybody know what an addict is? Okay, that's an archetype. Bill Wilson captured the addict archetype for the world. He described exactly what an addict is. And he said it wasn't personal. Everyone who is an addict does this. Everyone who does is an addict is an illness. And, and they have this behavior. It's not personal. Addicts lie when they want drugs. Addicts steal. It's not personal. They will steal from you if they want drugs. They will steal from you. It's not personal personal. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. That's an archetypal pattern. It's a pattern. And if I stepped into that pattern, it would go <laughs> and I would behave like an, like an addict. And I would start craving a substance. Could be anything. Could be sugar, could be booze, could be drugs, could be opium, could be, could be whatever thing I crave. Could be stuff, could be, could be rubies. It doesn't matter. An addict has a craving. And it means a craving, not just a preference, not an occasion, not just one of those things. It means I crave it. What a craving means is I will negotiate my integrity to get my hands on that. My brother died of alcohol. And believe me, he negotiated his family, his integrity, his well-being, his health, his job, and he died. Two treatment centers. There was nothing we could do. It was the most painful thing I have ever, ever endured, that any of us ever endured. He was the real thing. And we could say it wasn't personal. The only way you cling on is when you recognize that he would have, that that was stronger than his own personality. It was a possession by something. Do you get it now? Please tell me you get it. So I'm just confused. So it's, you know, it's, well, I, I understand I can tell. But is it our life purpose to let we leave the archetype? The life purpose is the journey, each archetypal pattern in us contains um, a kind of micro journey. A micro journey. The addict, those who have the addict, and each of us has addictions but not everybody will struggle with the addict. Some people have the addict, and it will control their whole life journey, and it will be part of what brings up their struggle that will develop, that force the development of their soul. Everyone will have addictions, but not everyone will be the addict. Like some, and, and, and our archetypes form our life lessons. They've, they've, because they contain each of um, I'm doing this too much. Let me start again. Every one of us has a package of 12 archetypal patterns that are unique to us. Eight, eight are unique to us and we share four. And that mixture, that mixture, come together to create the alchemy of our uh, talents, our fears, our incredible abilities, our visionary potentials, our capacity to love, our, all of our potential, and our potential in a positive way, and our potential in a negative way. And these huge ingredients um, are the substance 
that we, we have, that we are meant to work with in this lifetime. And the 12 archetypes are like the 12 rooms on earth that we get to work it out in. So I, for example, have a teacher archetype, which means I will work out my issues in the room called teacher. That's one of my rooms. One of my rooms is mystic. I don't have, for example, the room called pirate. So even though I find pirate adventures fascinating, I can only look, but I can't touch. I don't have the entrepreneur. So I can look at entrepreneurs and I find them fascinating. But if I walked into the entrepreneur archetype, I can't plug my energy into that because I have the wrong socket. It's like going to Europe without the transformer and I blow up. So I leave that archetype, but as soon as I come into an archetype that is called scholar or writer, I plug in and it goes because it's me. And now that I'm in my archetype, the lessons, all the stories about that archetype engage. The history of that archetype, everyone who's been a scholar, everybody, da 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 da, all the lessons, all the challenges, all of this start animating. Da -da -da -da. And, one, and then this plumb line drops, and there's my lesson for this lifetime. But I have access to the whole arch to the archive here. And what everybody associates with this archetype, because every archetypal pattern is full of the bank account of everybody's story in there. And everybody's, and the mythologies. Let me give you one that I definitely don't have. Let's go visit the princess. <laughs> Here's the princess archetype. Now, I will sit down in the princess bubble. We are in the princess bubble archetype. I have no business being in this one, but I got a visitor's pass. So here I am in the princess archetypal bubble. It, it looks like Disneyland to me, and I'm very uncomfortable, but I can, it just smells like cotton candy, but I'll, I'll, I'll I'll endure this for as much as I can. It makes me want to gag, but that's okay. All right, I'll get through this. I'll get through it. All right, I'll get through it. In this bubble are all these books about princesses and knights. Ah, here's one. Here's one. Wait, here. This is Snow White. Okay, oh, look at Snow White. <gasps> Lordy, she's waiting for her knight. Whatever happens. I'll read ahead. There she is in a glass. No, it's not a box. It's a coffin. He arrives too late. Well, I'll put this one back. Ooh, I'll spin the wheel. Let me see. No. These are all the stories of knights and princesses. And, oh, here's one. Lancelot and Guinevere. Whatever happened to them? Oh! Sad ending, they don't make it. Yikes, convent, oops, dead. Another story, what we find is there is a common theme with the princess and the knight. It doesn't end well. <laughs> Let me see, what else have we got here? Oh, Charles and Diana, oops! How did that work out? <laughs> <laughs> Yikes! Nevertheless, what is the princess archetype? When girls have this archetype, what is it they want? Let me see. Hit a button. All of them want download. They will look for a prince. They will want that prince to include a castle, 
or a palace. No, a castle. They think the castle's a palace, but it's not. <laughs> Castles are defense systems, <laughs> not palaces. They're usually ice cold, unfurnished, oh well. Most princesses these days don't know history. Fault line, okay. Let me see. They expect to be protected, taken care of, helpless out, lots of hero princess kind of thing. And when you have that archetype, and you're a princess, you like princess stuff. And it starts early on. You get dressed up in these little princess costumes. I'll be a princess at Halloween, ma your magic. You have your little wand, your little crown. You do all this. It's like a queen in the making. But many princesses do not include the queen archetype. You don't advance. It's just a little princess. But there's an inherent need to have a knight. Not a warrior, a knight. Okay, so um, it's just in them. That's what they need. A lot of women find, he disappointed me. Didn't have a castle. Didn't have a, what happened? A lot aren't disappointed. They really get their knight. But when you have that archetype, I gotta get out of this princess bubble. <laughs> okay, I'm out. <laughs> okay. When, when that archetype is in you, you can go to a room full of 2,000 men, and it engages, and they go, dee -dee 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 -dee. night, and that archetype magnetically is drawn to a knight, and they will find each other. They will find each other. And men who have the knight will go, dee -dee 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 -dee. princess. And that's how an archetype works. They are magnetic lines of communication. And they go, ding, like two magnets that find each other. Does that help you? So is it Jesus, <laughs> honest to God, you, uh, this is not your workshop. And I, ins I insist you snap at it. All right, I really have to go now. OK, is this? Is this helping you understand archetypes? Okay. And Stacy will take you on privately. Okay? So you can have a tutorial with her. Lunch, dinner, anything. But I can't. Okay? Now, what does this mean? Oh, I thought it was a football. Okay. Um, no, I'm not done yet. Okay, what I would like to do is, I have to finish my part, is that eventually you will want to know, well, something will make you ask, what's the meaning of this? What's the purpose of this? Something will make you ask that. Something will take you inside of yourself. Something will bring that, and you'll start going deeper into you. It might be an illness. It might be a trauma. It might be something that makes you see the difference between this type of frustrating pain and the need to actually find meaning and purpose beyond this. And, the, and the, the, the way that you find meaning and purpose is not by striving to understand the other. You will never get to the answer by trying to figure out why other people or anything else happened in your life. There is no answer to that, and it's none of your business. You will never, ever, ever have access to the soul of another person 
or their karma or their history or their never but if you make your quest if i only understood why that person you're going nowhere and your suffering is going to be intensified because you're going where you don't belong any more than if you can possibly imagine someone sitting somewhere going to therapy going to this investing thousands of dollars trying to figure you out and believe me, there are people in therapy wondering how in the world and why their paths ever crossed with you. Because of the damage you've done to their life. And how does that make you feel? Don't you wish they'd just get over it? Do you not? And how much simpler? And if you think about that, if you really, and I'm sure many of you do not spend your time thinking, oh, I wish I'd never hurt that person. You forgot about them already. I'll bet you most of you have forgotten about the people you've hurt. But they haven't forgotten about you. So that's how significant they are. And, and they're probably thinking, I just want it to be validated. And you've already wiped them off your radar. You've already wiped them off your radar. So what if they wiped you off your radar, their radar? It's, it's a wonderful idea. Start over again. What you quest is not what anyone else does, but why am I the way I am? What, what, why am I built the way I am? What makes me tick? What's the power in me? How come I lose my balance so easily? Or how come I feel driven to do art? How come I feel driven to do music? How come I feel, what is this compulsion in me? What motivates me? What is the power in me? How come I'm always attracted to this but never to that? How come? Who am I? Know thyself and you know God. How come all the spiritual masters? How do I come to know myself? What is the substance that I'm made of? These are the questions that are worth pursuing. It's not about questions about why am I still in pain? Who wounded me? Your life is not a who done it. Your life is about wow. What are, my, what are my power patterns? Am I using myself up? I want to die of creative exhaustion. This is your goal, die of creative exhaustion. You have no more to give, and that's why you're dying. I ran out of grace. I got no more to give. God's calling me home. And, and in order to, to, you want to see yourself mystically. You want to, you want to be able to look at the, the universe and say, what's really going on here? I do not want to respond because I'm frightened. I want to really get, get, I want to be able to see clearly what's the message here. What's the message here? I don't want to be swept up in a mob psychology where it costs my soul because I can't see clearly. I want to be able to hold my center and look through this. And, 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 and I want to be, even in relationships, I want to recognize this is engaging my warrior archetype. I'm with a bunch of warriors and it's engaging. I got, I got to step out. I got to step out. And it's not personal because anytime I walk in a room with a bunch of warrior types, my warrior gets engaged. I simply have to leave. It's not personal. Do you see what I'm saying? I am wise enough to my own archetypes to recognize it's not personal. When you get to the place and it's so relieving where you realize it's not personal here, even with your closest, closest beloved people in your life, and you get to the place where you recognize like, like with, with someone who's an addict, this is not him. This is the addict. It's not personal. What he's saying is not, per I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna be hurt because it's not personal. There's so much relief to that. 
This is the power in seeing yourself archetypally too, knowing I have this archetype and I need to deal with it because it's strong in me. I, I had someone in my workshop who was a kleptomaniac. And believe it or not, she's talking to me and I'm grabbing my purse. <laughs> wow. And I thought to myself, what's the difference between a kleptomaniac and just your basic hardcore th th thief? But I didn't ask her that, but I was wondering. But even when she said it, I was holding my, my, my purse. Really? Okay. But <laughs> wow. What do you like to take? Do you have a specialty? Perfume? Jewelry? What? But, and how do you define the difference? And, and she said it was a hobby, not a necessity. I was like, wow. Well, anyway. <laughs> but here's the thing. The pattern. She said it was stronger than her. She had no control over it, and she had to have control over it. That's an archetype. That's an archetype. Reminded me of the werewolf. Is it full moon yet? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the kleptomania comes out. <laughs> you know, lock me in a room. You know, I see a Neiman Marcus. You know, <laughs> but <laughs> oh no, I see Tiffany's. Okay, <laughs> okay, but you get so I. You know, when we come back from break, I just. I'm not in the mood for a break. When we come back for, from break, um, I'm not in the mood for a break. Um, um, I really want you, I'd like to just talk a little bit about your personal archetypes and the difference it makes as we progress to the next level. Because in my own work, I spent over 15 years teaching nothing but archetypes. And what I realized is the power of our archetypal myths, our personal myths, our personal beliefs are so strong. They control us. They control our biology. They control our psychology. They, they order our world. They order our world. And we will break up our lives rather than break up a myth. During the time that I was doing this, I recorded Sacred Contracts of America. When I did the 12 archetypes of the United States, and I saw what was coming that's happening now. I saw it because of the archetypes, because of the archetypal patterns. And in doing readings on you, on you, once I get your archetypes, being able to see what you're going to do is effortless because an archetypal pattern is a pattern which means unless you wake up to your own pattern the pattern is stronger than you and that's when I did the class on fate and destiny because your fate <clears throat> you will follow your fate the pattern will be stronger than you unless you wake up to your pattern and then you cooperate and you choose the, the, in other words, when you have a saboteur, you all have a saboteur. And the saboteur pattern is that part of us that engages at every crossroads, every single time, we have the opportunity to do something, say something, act in a way, any single time, we have an opportunity to act in a way that empowers us. And that could be as small as, as what you think of as insignificant as being in a conversation and answering a question honestly. Answering a, a question with integrity. Or it can be as on a much bigger platform in which you're given an opportunity and someone says, would you like to, in fact, I just got a, an email from someone saying she has an opportunity to speak at a Toastmasters um, competition and she wanted to use something from mine and da 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 da. And she wanted me to help her out on something. And 
so I, I, you know, agreed to this. I was writing her last night, just last night. And she was saying, you know, she could use the support because she's frightened. She's busting through the saboteur in her that would normally have backed down. But she's going to do it. She's not going to sabotage herself. She's going to accept this. Now, the saboteur archetype in us operates because we have an anguish, a natural anguish, about our own empowerment. I hear people say, I'm afraid of success or I'm afraid of failure. Both words, here we go again with words, are inappropriate. It is not failure or success. The word is empowerment. And you're afraid of your empowerment because the more you are empowered, the more it's not about success. Because you don't even know what that is when you're, it is about your capacity to increase the broadband of your intuition. This is what you're afraid of. You're afraid of becoming more intuitively alert and aware. Because with every, every single time you make a choice or respond or acknowledge that you heard a truth and you act on that truth, the next one is louder. The next one is bigger. The next one is more clear and your intuition becomes ever more honed, ever more refined. Your capacity to sense the truth becomes ever more accurate. And that's what you're afraid of. You're not afraid of success or failures. Don't ever use those words again. Call it what it is. You're afraid of having an accurate relationship with the truth. Why? Why? OK, so truth is the great change agent. So if you admit it, it, like you can be in a relationship for 400 years, then the day comes when you say, I'm not happy, and there it goes. And your 400 year history flies right out the window. Doesn't mean a thing. How many times people will say to me, just one of my closest friends was married. In fact, another one just before I came here, I go to this bank in, in Oak Park and this lovely bank, this teller I always go to, the same exact thing. She said, she asked me to look over something for her because she's going through divorce papers. I said, wow, what happened? She said, I was married 34 years to this man. And fine. She said, he just told me the truth. He doesn't want to be married his, because he doesn't want to share his pension. <gasps> 33, boom, the truth came out. Truth can finally came out. One little sentence, two words, no pension, no share. <laughs> Bye. The truth, the truth. I want it all for me, the truth. My other friend, 39 years of marriage, boom. Okay, and it could have been either way, male or female, doesn't matter. The moment the truth comes out, not happy, bye. Three words. <laughs> With yourself? Um, well, here's a truth that a lot of people find difficult to come to terms with. One is very easily that for example, I am an addict. That's very difficult for people to come to, to terms with. I am an addict. I have a family member struggling with gender identity. Very difficult struggle. 15 years, 18 years. Okay, very difficult to face the truth. Very difficult. Why? because that will change his life enormously. So as he sees himself, as he wanted to see himself, admitting finally the way everything is, very difficult. Very. There's nothing easy about that. So why? I mean, 
it, wh what, what if, wh what if you, you know, finally admitted, I mean, it, admitting something that's absolutely, or what if you finally said, I have lied about this all my life. I have lied to myself. Wait a minute, you need a microphone. How does that intersect with the willingness to go on to proceed and face the demons? Oh, because remember, one of the great teachings of all traditions, of all traditions, trust the teachings of all traditions. If you find it everywhere, you'll find that it is, truth is a salve. Truth never punishes you. Lies do. Um, it's the truth that truth sets you free. Mm -hmm. Truth really, how often have you heard things that people say, at least it's out? At least it's out. No matter how ugly something is, they will say, at least it's out. And the feeling that I don't have to hold that in, whatever it is, I've heard quotes on TV where murderers have said, at least it's out now. The pressure of holding a dark secret in, the pressure of having to deny, I can only imagine the madness going on in Washington is not because they're telling the truth. Truth does not create that. Truth does not create what we are witnessing. Ever. That is the handiwork of dark lies. <coughs> Very dark, salacious, maniacal, demonic lies. And one of them, one day, is going to say, my God, thank God it's out. And the sooner the better. <laughs>